Well, good evening, everyone. Oh, you can do better than that. <laughs> We're going to do this again. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, that's not so bad. <laughs> all right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure for all of you who've joined us here in person, and especially for those online. Um, welcome. My name is Dennis Mitchell, and I am the interim provost and executive vice president at Columbia University. Uh, I use he and him pronouns. I want to welcome you to today's discussion, our Awakening Our Democracy, what's at stake in these polarized times. I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, the School of Journalism, for their partnership in planning and hosting us in this beautiful space. Thanks, Jelani. Today's event is part of a dialogue across difference, which is a component of President Shafiq's Values and in Action Initiative. The initiative is designed to foster a resilient and inclusive community of learners and to engage with diverse perspectives and navigate challenging conversations. I'm hopeful that tonight, with a shared commitment to mutual understanding and respect, we can model the deep listening and exchange of ideas we're striving to uphold. Our Awakening Our Democracy series is Columbia's conversation series on disparities and justice issues at the forefront of the universities and the nation's consciousness. Especially in an election year, it's so important that we have the opportunity to engage with thought leaders, advocates, journalists, and scholars. The need for civic dialogue has never been greater. We know there's a direct connection between our ability to engage in civil discourse and the health of our democracy. Many have noted that the polarized nature of our discourse across the country, including on our own campus, but this isn't a conversation specifically about our campus. Tonight, we are here to tackle a much bigger question. What does all of this have to do with this country's democracy? Tonight, our panel of experts will explore how the often binary conversations around current events inform our understanding of our democracy. The elements that prevent us from coming together for civil discourse, and where do we go from here? So, without further ado, I'd like to begin our introductions for the evening. We are fortunate to have an esteemed group of scholars for today's event, which will be moderated, a uh, moderated discussion followed by a Q&A session. We will invite questions from students in the audience. Please note, we only have time to share some of our panelists' incredible accomplishments, so I strongly encourage you to Google them uh, <laughs> as you learn more about each and every one of them online. Our moderator today is Maria Hinojosa, the Pulitzer Prize winning founder of Futuro Media. Futuro Media is an independent nonprofit newsroom based right here in Harlem, New York City, with the mission to produce multi platform, community based journalism that respects and celebrates the culture of richness of the American experience. She has informed millions about the changing cultural political landscape in America and abroad as the anchor and executive producer of the Peabody Award winning show. Latino USA. Maria is also the co-host of Future Media's award-winning political podcast, In the Thick. And most recently, her Pulitzer Prize winning podcast, Suave. Maria has won four Emmys, the John Chancellor Award, two Robert F. Kennedy Awards, and the Overseas Press Club Edward R. Murrow Award. She is a distinguished journalist in residence at Barnard College, and these days her focus is deep accountability investigative journalism. We are so honored to have her moderating this evening's panel discussion. Thank you, Maria. And our panelists today include Dean Jelani Cobb, who joined Columbia University Journalism School, the faculty, in 2016 and became the dean in 2022. He's been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 2015. He received a Peabody Award for his 2020 PBS frontline <coughs> film, Whose Vote Counts, 
and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Commentary in 2018. He also has been a political analyst for MSNBC since 2019. Dean Cobb currently serves on the board of directors of the American Journalism Project and was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2023. Thank you, Jelani. Next, we have Dr. Jonathan Friedman, who is the director of the free expression and education programs at PEN America. He oversees research, advocacy, and education related to academic freedom, educational gag orders, book bans, and general free, general free expression in schools, colleges, and universities. An interdisciplinary scholar by training, Dr. Friedman has served as lead author on several of PEN, Pen America's reports. He regularly provides commentary for news media about educational censorship and has published op-eds for CNN, The Washington Post, The Hill, The Daily Beast, New Yorker Daily News, and Inside Higher Education. Thank you, Jonathan. We also have Professor May Nye, who is the Lung Family Professor of Asian American Studies and Professor of History here at Columbia University. She is a US legal and political historian interested in the histories of immigration, citizenship, and nationalism. She has written several award-winning books, most recently, The Chinese Question, which won the Bancroft Prize. She has written on immigration history and policy for the Washington <coughs> Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Atlantic, the Nation, and Dissent. Thank you, May. Next, we have Professor Bruce Usher who teaches courses on climate change, finance, and business, and is a recipient of the Singvai Prize for Scholarship in the Classroom, the Lear Award, and the Dean's Award for Teaching Excellence. Professor Usher is also on the Columbia Climate School faculty. In 2016, Professor Usher established the Columbia University Scholarship for displaced students, providing an opportunity for refugees to complete their higher education. Professor Usher is an active investor and advisor to the entrepreneurial ventures focused on climate change and clean energy and is chair of the Tamer Fund for Social Ventures. Thank you, Bruce. And finally, we have Dr. Courtney Cogburn, an associate professor at Columbia University School of Social Work. Dr. Cogburn employs a transdisciplinary research strategy to improve the characterization and measurement of racism and to examine the role of racism in the production of racial inequities in health. Her work also explores the potential of media and technology in eradicating racism. She is the lead creator of 1000 Cut Journey, which premiered at the 2018 Tribeca Film Festival. In addition to our esteemed panelists, we are honored to have President Manu Shafiq and President Laura Rosenberry from Barnard College joining us in the audience this evening. Again, Columbia stands firm on our commitment to fostering a vibrant and welcoming home to open debate and exchange. We have many perspectives up on this dais this evening, and I'm sure we'll all eager to hear what our panelists have to say. So Maria, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. So I, I wasn't planning on standing up, but then I figured you all really wanted to see the outfit. <laughs> <laughs> They're all like, what is happening? Uh, just trying to lighten the mood a little bit, because <laughs> it's gonna be an interesting conversation. So the first question, and then I have some opening remarks. So the first question, and they don't know what the first question is, but we actually are using this from our political podcast in the thick, which is actually a temperature check. So it's not a long, big answer. It's just like, so how you doing? We're going to start with you, Courtney. What's your temperature check? Today, right now, how you doing? Uh, doing fine. Contemplative. Can you put this, put, get the mic close contemplative, to Contemplative, I would, is how I would describe okay, how contemplative. I Okay. Uh, Bruce, 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 Bruce. How you doing? What's your temperature check? 
I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really looking forward to the questions from the audience and from hearing from the fellow panelists. Really, really excited. Dean? Oh, uh, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't go in order. I no, I'm trying order. to confuse yeah. everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm really good because also, you know, we're hosting and, you know, this is Pulitzer Hall. So I'm always thrilled whenever, you know, the lecture room is, is full and, uh, and we have President Shafiq here and President Rosenberg. We're really, you know, thrilled uh, to have everyone here this evening. Cool. Jonathan, what's your temperature check? Oh, my goodness. I spend my days oscillating between um, great worry <laughs> and then great optimism. So uh, today's probably more on the worry side. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the same time, you know, pleased to be in a room full of people to talk about these things. Cool, cool. May? Uh, well, I'm a little nervous. I'm very happy to be here and I'm very grateful for being invited. Um, I think these are hard questions and I hope we can have some open and honest discussion. So. So can you all just, you can move your microphones. Dean Cobb doesn't need to do anything, but <laughs> the rest of you just <laughs> maybe move them a little bit closer. I really want you all to be relaxed. My goal would be that our panel of esteemed people, so brilliant, erudite, actually that you interrupt each other. That would really be my hope, is that you have, n like is, we're just missing the tequila. Um, so I actually we can, I, we can supply that actually we can no alcohol at student if at events where students are present I know this um, I actually just so you know I actually uh, sip a shot of tequila every evening around this time any later and I can't do it um, just so you know tequila helps control cholesterol that is a fact not debatable um, actually Dr. Alfredo Quiñones Hinojosa former undocumented immigrant, now the head of neurosurgery at the Mayo Clinic. He's the one who told me that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I really hope that we can actually interrupt each other. It's okay, like if we had the tequila and we were all sitting around at my house, we'd all be kind of jumping in and, and so that would be my goal. Um, and we will open it up to, to questions, primarily from the students is who we're hoping to hear from. Um, so my temperature check, I also, like May, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, so today I taught and I was just like, we're going to end class a little early because this is what it looks like when a professor is a little nervous. And they were like, oh, because I want my students to know everything about what's happening in my life as a professional because that's what I teach. It's a, I'm a professional who is now on the campus. Um, and I would say still I battle every day to fight through for the optimism. Mm. And when I do that, and now I'm just gonna give my opening remarks and then it's really about this, but I really wanted to just kind of get these things off my chest as it were, because my necklaces are really <laughs> bling, 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 okay. <laughs> so um, I fight for a hope, a sense of ho optimism and hope. Um, and I do that because when I get really, you know, I, as a journalist, I go back to my founding father as a journalist and thankfully there's a statue of him just four blocks from my house and that would be Frederick Douglass. Mm. And so when I think about the hell that I may be living through, I'm like, but think about what Frederick had to go through and he made it and your experience as a journalist in this country is tied to him and all of his descendants, Ida B. Wells, Hobi Taidar, eh, Ruben Salazar, uh, Molly Ivins, you know, we are all part of this long arc of journalists of conscience in this country and we play a particular role. So I lift myself up in that. But I also um, think, ab think about it historically because I know I'm only 25, but you know I have this long historical vision <laughs> of decades. Um, you know, the polarization that I've lived through, uh, I, I wrote this, I wrote, my life in the United States equals polarization. You know, when I was a kid, there were assassinations here. Student protesters were killed by the National Guard. There were uh, protests like at the Democratic National Conne uh, Convention. I was uh, living in Chicago. Um, so we saw that young people getting their heads beaten open for doing nothing, which is why, and just trigger alert, right? Some of you may be just like, but when I was growing up, we called them the pigs. There was no other 
in my house, a house of Mexican immigrants, because we saw what happened. We saw it on television. There was a lot more, some of you know this, right? There was a lot more that we were seeing then on TV, actually, on the TV news. Um, but also, there was class polariza polarization, right? I mean, I was growing up on the south side of Chicago, where it was predominantly black, and then I'd go to El Barrio Mexicano, where it was all Mexicano, and then on the very north side, it was all white. You know, so I understood, like, what is going on here in terms of, and again, always from an immigrant perspective, because I had a Mexican passport and a green card. Um, and by the way, the experience of mis- and disinformation, though intense now, has always existed in our country. And uh, even though, if you want a fun way to find out about this, watch a TV show on HBO, or is it Max, called The Plumbers, which is about Watergate. And you will see how at that time there was the active use of mis- and, dis and disinformation uh, by the Republican Party then in the White House. So also not new in our country. Propaganda, not new in our country, though difficult for us to use these terms. And specifically on the question of immigration, which is one of the most polarizing points right in our country right now. Um, a history, I would say, Dean Cobb, of our fellow uh, journalist colleagues of our generation who are just frankly lazy and grew up on a diet of anti-immigration journalism that can't think beyond a narrative of, oh my god, they're coming, and this is terrible. It Hello, we have been here since forever as immigrants in this country, and if we were going to destroy this country, it would have happened already. Right? Feet on the ground. Um, now, um, I do want to talk about the elephant in the room, right, which is what's happening on our campuses, on our, right, on our two campuses. So you need to know that um, as a kid growing up a, on the south side of Chicago, yes, I went to the University of Chicago High School, my father was a medical doctor at the UFC, um, but I didn't really know about, um, about the Ivy League, but then I found out about Columbia, and the way I found out about Columbia was through the protests of 1968. Mm. And so Columbia, to me, it first was in my mind as like, whoa, what a cool place. <laughs> wow, you have students who are so committed to stopping a war, to bringing the war right to the campus that they did this, wow. Um, so there was an attraction to me for this campus for the fact that it was a place that allowed right, that kind of protest. Um, and you know, President Barack Obama shut down Hamilton Hall. You do know this, right? He led the anti-apartheid movement on this campus and shut down Ham Hamilton, wherever. <laughs> Hamilton, Hamilton, <laughs> where, Hall. Um, and then I, I, and myse myself and journalist Laura Flanders, mm. um, we shut down the Barnard College giving a Medal of Honor to then uh, the representative to the United Nations, Jean Kirkpatrick, who we knew was a warmonger at that time. And we took on the Barnard administration. It was a challenge. They rescinded the award. So to me, it's all a part of difficult moments, but but we don't stop. I'm about to stop, though. <laughs> Finally, I don't stop in the dialogue. I work out in a gym in Connecticut where we have a cottage this big, OK, this big. But I work out in a gym with women who are all avid, deep Trump supporters. And so I learn in these moments. Her t-shirt last week said, wokeness equals weakness. In the class that she's teaching me, she knows exactly who I am. I'm like, okay. But we talk. <clears throat> we talk. Not every day, not every workout. So it can't happen all the time, but we dialogue. So, Jelani, the notion of polarization is kind of a huge one. I want your immediate take on just like, well, how do we even approach polarization, which is this huge. And by the way, again, if any of you want to jump in, go ahead. But, Jelani, Polarization. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, first I want to thank you. Um, uh, I'm always uh, you know thrilled to have you in the building. 
Uh, once upon a time, I lived around the corner uh, from uh, Futuro Media, uh, and I would pop in. I would show up on the podcast. It was like our neighbor Jelani is coming, um, and you know I, I miss those days. But uh, you know, I'll, I'll also preface by saying that you know the conversations that we're engaged in here uh, in the journalism school are consistently about how our uh, students, how our graduates operate in the context of a world uh, in which people do not believe, very often do not believe uh, what we're saying. And their willingness to believe is uh, related to where they are on the ideological spectrum. Uh, and you know, a phenomenon I've, uh, I've come to deem uh, a la carte reality. You know, you, <laughs> you can accept the things that you like and, um, and not have these parts. Uh, and you know, we're uh, you're trying to navigate a world in which we are uh, giving people information, very often information that they do not want to have, or information that challenges their beliefs, uh, or information that makes them feel insecure about their place in the world, and so on. And the easiest response to that is simply to say, oh, that's fake, or that's media bias, or that is, not to say that we're perfect, we're far from it. Um, but that is the, the way that polarization shows up most commonly in our experience. Now, because my approach to journalism is, is always inflected by history, I do want to give a little bit of context here. We're in the year 2024. Um, you know, I don't believe that history repeats itself, you know, but you know, there are familiar echoes in, in the past. If we were to go back a century ago to 1924, and May uh, can talk about this uh, you know, far more eloquently than I, uh, but we would go back to 1924, we would see a similar upsurge of uh, xenophobia, nativism, condemnation around issues of immigration. Uh, and so you know, when I would talk with my students, uh, I would say, OK, you know, you know, an exercise. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, a religious community that has been accused of supporting terrorism, having aid and sympathy uh, to the United States uh, enemies, and members of whom have been deported uh, because of their believed uh, sympathies with uh, antagonistic forces. And people will say, oh, we're going to talk about Muslims after 9-11. I'll say, no, we're going to talk about Jews after World War I. Uh, and so uh, we would have that same kind of conversation, like, oh, OK, we're going to talk about a community that um, has been accused of bringing drugs into the country, uh, of kind of harboring uh, you know, narcotics traffickers, uh, and of taking jobs from Americans. And people are like, oh, we're going to talk about Latinos. We're going to talk about Mexicans. Um, I was like, no, we're going to talk about the Chinese in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we can see those kinds of echoes. We also see the kinds of dynamics that have roiled, not coincidentally, you know, as we have seen in the, the last election, presidential election in 2020, these huge issues around uh, immigration, also around voter access. If you listen to you know, what civil rights uh, communities were talking about, access to the ballot, you know, access to the vote, and these were kind of huge issues. If you were to go back a century ago, you saw that same sort of thing. Um, it was the desire to make sure that African Americans did not have access to the ballot, uh, and the concern about the numbers of people who were immigrating into the country and whether it would literally change the complexion of the country. Uh, if we would go back to 1796, we could have that same, 1798, we could have that same conversation. And so it's important to recognize that the dynamics, you know, the phenomenon that we see is unique, it's particular, it, it's specific, idiosyncratic, it has all these kinds of elements that are important to understand, uh, but it is not novel. And as we're looking at the, the polarization that we're operating in, we should be informed about the, the forces that drove polarization in earlier times as well. Can I jump in with another year? I was just going to say May. <laughs> I was going to say May. I, I don't want to talk about 1924 because mm -hmm. it's the 100th anniversary, and that's all I'm doing this year is mm -hmm. giving lectures about 1924. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about 1994, which was when Newt Gingrich, as Speaker of the House, uh, I believe commenced 
us on this trajectory of polarization in our modern times. Gingrich had a strategy uh, of zero-sum politics, no compromise, no concessions, confrontation only. And I think that is, I think you can trace the political polarization of our own time to that moment. And what that did was not only uh, polarize and paralyze the Congress, um, not as bad as today, but still, um, but also it was concurrent with a move, moves by uh, conservatives to accrete power through undemocratic means, by which I mean gerrymandering, court stacking, voter suppression, because they knew that their views were deeply unpopular, so they needed to attack democracy in order to accrete power to implement views, policies that are actually very unpopular. So if you take something like abortion, right, it took a long time for them to get to Dobbs, but if you look at abortion, I think a polarization is not even really the right word. 70% of Americans believe women should have access to abortions. The 23% believe nobody should, there should be no abortions under any circumstances. That 23% has dictated to the majority of Americans what policies should be. Now it's more complicated, there's the court and there's states, et cetera, et cetera, but my point is that deeply unpopular measures have been enacted in this country and it looks like polarization, but actually I think it's an attack on democracy. I mean, you could say the same thing about issues around immigration. Mm -hmm. Like, Yeah, most, peop most Americans most people think immigration's okay. They think it's okay. Yeah. Although, polling, yeah. It's you know, gone down, but Latinos yeah. and Latinas are specifically being targeted with mis and disinformation like on a massive level. But for example, my, my Connecticut gym buddies were telling me about things that were going on in my little teeny tiny town in Connecticut where it was like, yo, I think we have to go to the border. I think we got to stock up and drive down to the border because there's an invasion happening. And I'm like, these are people who I'm shopping with so they are victims of mis and disinformation, which again is not new. And thank you for that historical perspective, which is, it's not new. Right, so dialogue is important, but in order to have dialogue, you have to have a democratic structure. Mm -hmm. Dialogue depends on democracy. And once you have people tearing down on democracy, how can you have a conversation? So I, I mean, personally, I don't know how everybody else feels. I, I feel we're beyond polarization. Now we're at, election deniers, conspiracy th theorists, political violence. You know, these are not, this is not a dialogue anymore. This and, is you're, about you, and that is going towards? I th well, I'll say authoritarianism, but I could use the F word also. Mm -hmm. Fascism. Yeah, I was like. Oh, oh that one. <laughs> yeah, I was like. Yeah, right, like that one. <laughs> no, the other one too. The other one too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I grew up learning about fascism through reading Mad Magazine, and some of you are like, what is she <laughs> talking about? Find it. It was a term that was used a lot in Mad Magazine, was fascism, and don't be a bigot, and all these words that were of the moment, and I was learning it through a, a magazine that was uh, comedy, essentially. Courtney, what's, what's going on as you approach the issue of polarization? And I, I think it is important to say you grew up in a small town in Oklahoma that you basically were like, it's my family, <laughs> it's our town, basically, because <laughs> it's, it's a very, very small place. Yeah. And so this conversation about polarization, I'm wondering about how you see it, considering where you come from, those roots. I mean, I think the, fir the first thing that came up when you first asked the question in follow the following remarks was this idea of, like, is there the illusion of polarization and who benefits from that? So just like you're saying, May, like, or do we really disagree to the extent that's sort of being forwarded, and who benefits from creating a discourse that's so um, divided? And I, and I think it's happening now as well. Like, I don't think we disagree as much as we think we do, right? Or as much as we're, we're claiming these sides and we're battling, but I think there's a lot of shared ground. Um, and so for me, I'm, and I don't have an answer to this, but sort of the question of who benefits from creating even an illusion that there is a greater divide than there may actually be. So when, when you think about that, who do you think uh, wins there? People who don't want a democracy. 
Mm. And how do you see those people within the context of, of our country, right? I mean, that's, because they are not going anywhere either. And I think, I mean, I think it's the importance of making visible the dynamics that we're, that we're talking about and making it plain. I think too often we're in this space of uh, defending a position as opposed to creating the kinds of context that we're talking about tonight around being in conversation, staying critical, sharing information, dealing in facts, not a la, a la carte uh, reality is a that's or, a good yeah, one, right? Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, you, um, you, can, you can use it. I'll use it. Yeah, <laughs> but we we'll always say, as Dean Jelani Cobb says, <laughs> but but there's 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 something that's lost when we are stuck in a place of yelling, as opposed to considering everything we're talking about is deeply complex, complicated. Some of it's very simple, but some of it's very complicated that requires thought and consideration and different points of view and different sources of knowledge. And if we don't have that space to have those kinds of conversations, um, I, I agree with May, like you, you, you lose democracy. Bruce, I was actually gonna ask you about fear within the context because so much of this is around fear, but you can jump in and respond to Courtney. Well, I'd like to respond, actually what I'd like to do is agree mm. with you. I, I think we are much less divided <coughs> than we realize. I think, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot more common ground than we recognize. By the way, the mic says, do not lean into mic, but I can't help I myself. Can't help when I speak, it. I lean into the mic. Um, so on November 8th, 2016, Donald Trump, was elected president, was it November 8th? Mm -hmm. That came as a surprise to me. It came as a surprise to almost all the faculty I teach with. It came as a surprise to surprised almost all my students. He was surprised, surprised too. <laughs> and so the next day I walked into the office of uh, one of my colleagues, kind of my mentor, a uh, wonderful man named Ray Horton at the business school. And I said, we don't know what's going on in this country. Our peers don't know what's going on and our students by and large, don't know what's going on in this country. We gotta find out. So we started a course. The course is called uh, Bridging the American Divides. We launched in 2017. This is our seventh year teaching it. <coughs> it's six weeks of in-class discussions with the students on divisive topics. We cover the topic of immigration, globalization, the media, and so on. And then we spend four days visiting a city in the U.S. Mostly been going to Youngstown, Ohio. It's a very interesting, divided city. Sometimes we go in North, northern Alabama, Decatur, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And we just meet with people. We just talk. The objective of the course is not to change anybody's mind, least of all our students' minds. We're not trying to prove anybody, convince anything. It's not a debate. It's simply to understand why we're polarized. What's going on out there? Why do people have these positions? And you know what happens when you sit down and actually talk to someone face to face? By the way, when you're gonna do this online because of COVID 2020, class was a disaster. You cannot have these conversations online. When you talk face to face, we're not that far apart. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of commonalities. And the problem is in the modern era, we don't, we don't talk much. We're, we're not much in the gyms talking to the people. With that. I, lo I love that. Not too many people are doing what you're doing, Maria. I didn't know what I was doing. I wanted to work out in the gym and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God. Here it is, and it, it is a, a great exercise. But, but, but. I want to disagree a little bit. Okay, but wait, but all right, but okay. then Jonathan, you're, you're coming no, up. All right, go ahead, May, go. Well, I think we have common ground, and then we don't. There's a lot of things that Americans don't agree about. And Jelani gave you a whole list, going back to the 18th century. There are serious issues where Americans have been divided, and the answer to I mean, a lot of this goes to who's included and who's excluded, mm -hmm. right? And on what grounds do you include people and exclude people? And we have had a long history of people who are excluded trying to be included. And the more you have that, the more you have a more robust democracy, but then people who control the situation before that get upset because they're no longer the majority. And I think that's happened across history. It's not, I don't think it's a straight line, you know, it goes up and down and sideways. But if you have a functioning democracy where everybody <coughs> does have a vote and people are not excluded from the polity, then you have a way to work out differences. right? So we do have differences, but should the minority dictate to the majority? 
what our policy should be. Sh should the minority tell people how to run their private lives? You know, there, there are certain principles involved that I think we agree about in terms of what makes a democracy. So I think there are a lot of issues where we do have common ground, but not everything is that. I think there's also people who have vested interests, histories that they want to protect, and they have to learn to live with the rest of us. I feel that's a lot of what's gone on in this country. And so, um, you know, I mean, there's, you know, civil rights for people of color does not mean fewer rights for white right. people. Right, it's right. not a zero sum. It's not a zero sum game. Zero -sum. So as long as it's posed that way, then we, we appear to be really polarized. So, but to me, framing it as uh, common ground, I think doesn't maybe go far enough in terms of how do we get to a common ground because we have to work through those differences. And sometimes the difference is, you're a minority, you lose. Sorry. Jonathan. Such a long, his such a long history of that, right? <laughs> um, you know, there's so many threads here. I think I'll just share a few thoughts that are on my mind in response. But to me, as I reflect on the question of polarization, because there's so much one could say about it, but it, it, where I see it playing out is in the dampening of curiosity across mm -hmm. political lines. Um, you Absolutely. can think about this. Uh, uh, you know, I, I have the privilege of getting to think and talk with a lot of people who work at and, you know, make their lives on university campuses. And the university campus is the most radical idea, okay, as a concept. But, um, you know, I think it's that, that lack of curiosity, whereas people once could understand that they might, you know, I, I'm Republican and my friend is Democrat and we bowl together. And we, you know, rub each other, you know, we, we kind of tease each other a little about our political possessions. But, you know, that's my friend who's different from me, and that's okay. I think you see that much less. I think that when I went to college 20 years ago, you could meet a person, you didn't know anything about them. You had to kind of see who they were. It was like an opportunity, um, and particularly like in diverse communities, uh, uh, to diverse campuses, you can meet people and be so curious about their lives and how they came to their positions and you can negotiate that. And now I think a lot of that, whether it's mediated through social media, where you can quickly see what the person has posted before you decide if they're worth talking to much more, uh, or maybe you aren't even necessarily talking to them that much in person because you are primarily interacting through the media that uh, you know encourages you to yell at people in short, snappy bursts. Um, so all of that you know, just pollutes whatever might have existed in terms of the uh, ability to be curious. And I think that curiosity is how we get to that common ground. I do think, you know, some of it exists. And, you know, in my own life, many moments of what I would call, like, when I reflect on how I've changed, where I grew, an interesting professor, an interesting teacher, an interesting neighbor, those moments have come through that kind of curiosity and surprise. Uh, the person who I met in Brooklyn and was talking to once and was hearing about how he had a 90-year-old grandmother, 90-year-old grandmother, he was like 50, okay, so it was really shocking, who lived in Santiago, Chile. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this person looked Latino, I didn't think anything of it, and then a little bit later on I discovered that he was Palestinian, and so was his grandmother in Chile. And it was like this story of global migration that is you know, not well understood publicly. It's nothing I've ever seen in a movie or read about, something I found out through that curiosity. But I think the other challenge that we face is the way that polarization is corrupting and challenging our institutions like never before, particularly public ones. So what does the public university or public library stand for, or public school? Is it about all ideas and everything is welcome? Or are there a set of things we also very much believe in? Like, I don't know, we have a round earth, we live in a solar system, uh, vaccinations are a good thing. And we are so challenged right now to hold those two ideas at the same time when it does feel like polarization doesn't properly uh, capture my feeling on January 6th, because I know exactly where I was in January 6th. I know exactly what I was thinking as I was watching that news. I was in bed with COVID, okay? And I was watching that, and it was, you know, that moment of, we don't know who, you know, this part of the country we don't know at all. And so on one hand, universities can be such a force in this, but at the same time, it's incredibly difficult to imagine a place like this where at its core, we're supposed to completely disagree with each other all the time. None of us has been prepared to be in an environment like that day in, day out. 
So, Jel Jelani, sure. actually, I, I know you want to jump in. My question to you, not question, but my comment, because you brought up January 6th, right? Which, yeah. Um, polarization or attempted coup d'etat? Which, as you know, our colleagues had a very hard time saying, right? And right. I, I believe we still, until this election is resolved, we still continue to live in a perpetual state of attempted coup d'etat. But our colleagues will not right. use that term or, as May says, discuss uh, authoritarianism or fascism because, it, let's just say, on this case, white supremacy mm -hmm. may be uncomfortable to them, but it's not going to cost them in a way that it might cost you or me. Right. Therefore, it's a different way to approach this conversation. But take it away, yeah, Dean. Yeah, so I mean, I think that we have to be very real about some things that relate to power. You know, that there are the dynamics like uh, in um, the society in which people have a kind of false sense of people who are unlike them or different from them uh, in some superficial way or some substantial way as being uh, an enemy or the opponent or something. And I think that that's kind of one part of this. Uh, but another part of this is that, you know, there is a very real uh, concerted effort to preserve power uh, on behalf of some uh, elements in the society that have traditionally had a disproportionate share of it. Uh, and so on the, the minority point, um, about whether people would be dictated to by minorities. It's an interesting thing because it takes me back to that old uh, idea when they say that democracy is uh, two foxes and one rabbit voting on what to have for dinner. <laughs> but that's actually not democracy. That's majority rule. Democracy would be we don't eat anything until it's unanimous, which means that we're all equally empowered. Uh, and so, when we're talking about that kind of power sharing arrangement to people, you know, the foxes in the society think that that's not a good thing. Uh, and we, we cover this, we report on this, and to the lines that, uh, that Maria was talking about, we went through, we, should, we could create an anthology of the euphemisms for the behavior uh, that, that was attendant to Trumpism. You know, my favorite was the economic anxiety one. You know, they were screaming every kind of uh, misogynist, misogynistic epithet, every kind of racist idea. You know, Trump began his campaign uh, by, by saying that we were being uh, besieged by Mexican rapists, and everybody was like, this is the economy, um, in order to get around, you know, talking about this in a very straightforward way. Uh, the last thing that I'll say about this is a kind of like biographical detail. I apologize if you have heard this before because I've been telling this to anyone who will listen. Um, we like this, though. We like this. <laughs> right. I am from Jamaica, Queens. Well, actually, Donald Trump and I are both from Queens. He is from Jamaica Estates. I am from South Jamaica. <laughs> Those two neighborhoods have exactly the relationship you would presume, presume based upon their names. Um, Jamaica Estates is elite. Um, traditionally, uh, upper class white, South Jamaica was working class, uh, black and brown, literally divided by the Long Island Railroad train tracks. Uh, and so he grew up in a point where Queens was the second whitest borough in New York City. Uh, it was so white that when Jackie Robinson, Jackie Robinson, when Jackie Robinson, the famed Dodger second baseman, moved to Queens, a cross was burned near his property to let him know he was not welcome there. That's what Queens was. The Queens that I grew up in was the, what it is now, on, en route to becoming what it is now, the most diverse county in the United States, where by some estimates, as many as 800 languages are spoken. Oh my God, that sounds so scary. It sounds so scary. But, but oh my God. What it translates into is like a lot of good ethnic cuisine. And um, a lot of good people to fall in love with. I mean, I'm just saying. Like, I mean, if, what if, what if, But what if the headlines, Dean, if you and I had been running the papers, right, and we were like, oh, my God, uh, 15,000 Bangladeshis are arriving. It's going to be amazing. Uh, right. You know, or um, 10,000 people from Honduras, do you know how they're going to trans uh, transform our uh, roofing system? I don't know. Anything that they're that they are known for to celebrate it. Instead, it's the terror. It's the terror. And so the people of his generation had that response, you know, of the his generation, the Queens residents. For those of us who are old enough to remember the, remember the TV show All in the Family, 
uh, Archie Bunker, who was the besieged but lovable bigot. Um, that show was set in Queens. It was supposed to reflect the anxieties of Trump's generation of white Queens residents and the distinction between what happened after the 1965 Immigration Reform Act and how it transformed all of this. It is not coincidental that the most xenophobic, uh, the most xenophobic politician in modern American history is a product of the most diverse county in the United States. There is a relationship between those two things. Can and we I, love can that. Can I amend your fox and rabbit story? Go me. I think what the foxes did was that they prevented 100 rabbits from being in the room to vote. Mm. Mm. I would look at it that way. Mm. They took care of business. Well, I'm, you know, I mean, I, I just think that, well. Go on. <laughs> now May is about to let it be known. Go on. Well, I, I think that, you know, I want to go back to this point about dialogue. OK. Because um, uh, I think dialogue really is important, and that's a lot of what we've been talking about, right? How to, how should journalists speak? How should journalists, journalism encourage dialogue among the citizens, um, not be an echo chamber for, like, you know, Fox News or whatever? Or I think what plagues mainstream journalism is this both sidesism. So you know the pros and cons of cannibalism, for example. <laughs> yeah, or that you know whatever Trump does is gets a huge amount of attention, and Biden doesn't even get a fair shake. I mean, there's this re very weird both sidesism in journalism, but I think that you know I, I really want to stress that dialogue requires democracy, and if we don't have a democratic structure, if we don't have a democratic culture, we can't have dialogue because then people are shut down, they're suppressed, et cetera. And I just want to talk about what's happening here at Columbia, if I may. Go. Because I think that, you know, I, you know, I was looking at the website today, and I think the website is really beautiful when it states our values. You know, we uphold the values of teaching people how to think, not what to think, helping students discover the many complex ideas to every issue, creating an environment where people feel challenged and learn to navigate the discomfort that comes with it. I think that's really beautiful stated, beautifully stated. I feel sadly we haven't lived up to those values recently. You know, student groups have been banned. Um, we have a task force on anti-Semitism, but not on other forms of racism. Um, and I, I just think that, you know, certain phrases or utterances are kind of deemed uh, outside the bounds of discourse because it makes some students feel uncomfortable or harmed. And I think if we really want to have dialogue, we have to have a situation where everybody can have freedom of speech, that we uphold academic discourse. We don't punish students or faculty for s speaking things that some people feel are unpopular. So I think it's a really fraught moment here. And if we're going to have a dialogue, and I'm really thankful for this opportunity, I think we have to go back and look at our the values that we say we have and think about how we can actually live up to them better. Mm -hmm. Courtney, I want to hear about your thoughts regarding that specifically, but also the larger question that Dean Cobb was raising, which is, again, essentially fear. Um, and again, I love going back to Oklahoma, right? This just notion of well, what that felt like. But you can respond to. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I agree 100%. And I think fear is what gets in the way of aligning our actions and our and our values I think too often we're making decisions based on fear um, and I think we also make those decisions and, and that misalignment happens when there's a lack of honesty and transparency about what's dictating the choices that we're trying to make um, and and I don't pretend right to understand the the difficulties of leading institutions be it a, a school or a, a university and the, and the kinds of things that have to be calculated and considered when we're making those decisions but I do think it's important to be transparent as much as we can be about what is um, informing the choices that we're trying to to make what's but and also to acknowledge the misalignment when it is happening um, but I think often we don't do that and we kind of we keep referencing the values but not where there's a disconnect between so what would you say what would I say about what are in answer to their question what are the how did you pose it what are the the ways in which we are approaching this discourse and not being and not being able to name those things what would you what would you call what we are living through then right now 
I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, I mean, as a professor, how are you how are you in having this conversation with your students, for example, encouraging them to look beyond fear or to be able to engage in dialogue? Or what May said, which I haven't encountered, May, so that's interesting. I haven't encountered students who, I mean, maybe it's because I teach a class on writing through trauma uh, mm -hmm. or, or um, specifically owning your personal narrative. So I haven't had that. But you, yeah. you can't just say disregard your fear, right? And in, in, in the classroom when I'm having uh, these conversations with my students, it's starting from a place of we have had these kinds of conversations with each other before. So when something is escalated, right, in the heat of a moment, we have an established way of speaking with each other about difficult things. We have an existing relationship. There's a degree of trust. You can't just ask people to, to put their fear to the side and have these kinds of conversations. There has to be some sort of human connection that's also there to support that we can make it to the other side of this conversation. 100%. And if I don't believe that, if we can't both end up on the other side of this conversation somewhat whole, why would I engage in that type of, of discourse Bruce. Uh, with you? So the experience I learned from teaching this course, this Bridge the American Divide course, is these conversations are really hard to have because you're all trained, we all train you to listen, to respond. We train you to have the best argument, to win the debate, to have the facts on your side, to make a point. And if you want to have these discussions, you cannot listen to respond. You can only listen to understand. And listening to understand is really hard to do. If I say something that you fundamentally disagree with at your root, it's really hard to just sit there and go, let me listen, let me understand what this person is trying to say your whole being is going to respond. And that's not, that's not a dialogue. That's, well, I think that's where I, we are, I are today. Also, also, you know, it's something you have to, it's not something that occurs to us. I think it's this idea that we all like are born with that as a sense of something important or a skill or we arrive on a campus and we're just going to be like open to the world, you know, and, and that we would never try to practice it, that we would just know it. Nothing else do we assume we're good at without practicing. I think we've lost the idea that when you go to university, you're supposed to be challenged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you're here to learn. Mm -hmm. And what we want is a robust intellectual environment where people can dig deep into issues, not react to slogans where fear has a high premium, but do the work, do the research, have the debate. What's the history? What's the context? And you know, I personally did not like it when we all, the professors all had to tr give trigger warnings in our classes. I'll just say that. You know, I don't think anybody should say anything offensive, but if you can't read about slavery without having a panic attack, you need help. I mean, it's not that, you know, the answer is not that we don't talk about slavery or sexual violence. If you're that upset you can't sit in a classroom and hear about it or read it in the context of literature or something or a history. You know, so I, I think we've well I'm now I'm really going out on a limb here. Oh, this is this <laughs> is I, the great I, this is what of it our is, time. Right? I, I think have that been the dismayed at the fragility our students have and what they demand of us to not talk about certain things. And uh, so you have to deal with fear, but the way you deal with fear is you dig down deep. You have a robust conversation. Nothing should be out of bounds. You know, short of violence against each other, we should be able to, to talk, to argue. And so I think that's part of what's so upsetting right now is that there's this climate on campus where you can't talk about, you can't be supportive of Palestine without people accusing you of being anti-Semitic. We need to understand the history, what happened in the Middle East. It's a long history. It goes way back before October 7th, which was horrible, of course. But it, history in the Middle East didn't start on October 7th. We need to teach that history. We need to learn it. And so I think that you know, it's not about people's feelings. It's about if you come to university, you should be challenged, and you should be, want to be challenged, and you should, you should challenge the idea, all, everything your parents told you, you should question. <laughs> everything you learned in also, high school, also, you should question. 
Also, your parents, um, just, I, lo I love to tell my students, <laughs> your parents are also terrified all the time, too. Because <laughs> they don't know what they're doing, even though you think they know what they're doing. So there's a lot of, uh, fear is actually something that is coming up a lot, This right? is where you become an adult. This is where you become an independent-minded person that can think for themselves, figure out problems for themselves, and back up your opinions with argument. Dean. Um, I have one footnote to add to that because I think in the journalism space we have to navigate both of those things. We send students out to our graduates out to cover war. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have something here called the Dart Center for Journalism and Trauma. Um, <coughs> that was just uh, you know at a well, it's actually still ongoing a symposium uh, that the Dart Center is holding uh, on this. And I think the balance is this. If you talk to most journalists after a while, especially if they've done like kind of metro or beat reporting, they have horrific things that they've seen, that they've covered, that they've written about. You know that that is implicit within um, the job. There's no trigger warning about it. There's no kind of presumption about it. But we've also been poorly served by that. You know, we recognize that in the long run, you know, when people get together and talk about, remember this case, remember this, there's this thing of secondhand trauma. Uh, and there is this thing in which the way in which we report a story can further exacerbate the trauma that people are experiencing. And, and I think that that's useful for us to think about in the sense that we can't cushion, nor should we, cushion uh, the uncomfortable realities of the world. Um, we should teach the entire history of the Middle East. We should teach the entire history of every kind of contextual conflict we find ourselves in. Um, we should also be clear about providing people with the resources they need to navigate that emotionally. Um, I think that there's no, um, there's no shame in operating on both of those poles simultaneously. So um, there's, also, there's also the reality that, I mean, yes, Dean Cobb, and we are at the J School, which is actually doing reporting, which is, to me, um, you combat polarization by talking to everyone all the time about anything, right? Trying to have that mentality. But when you go and you engage with people, let's just say the question of immigration in New York, the fact that the wall has come here, right, in many ways, and that we have a mayor who is instigating so much of this, what, 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 what can we do, especially in a place like New York, I went down to the Roosevelt Hotel, which is now, you know, the, what are they calling it? The new Ellis Island, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's where the migrants and refugees are being situated. But when you ask the question to somebody, um, one of the women who I met who was out, out in front at about eight o'clock in the morning, um, and I just was like, so do you, I, I asked her if she knew about the protests that were happening. She was like, que? <coughs> Almost like we don't have time to be thinking about the protests. We're busy. We're trying to make uh, we're trying to make things. We're trying to, to to make things happen. And I said to her, you know, there's a lot of talk about your presence here and what you might be taking. Or, and I said, do you see yourself as a victim of any sort, or do you see yourself as a woman who is going to get things done? And she was like, I am not a victim. Mm. I am not a victim. I'm getting stuff done. And the other untold story was that she said, when I got, because I'm like, well, how did you get from there to here? To, you know, and she was like, well, anyway, I land in LaGuardia, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get to the church where they had told me I needed to go. And New Yorkers at the LaGuardia airport are walking up to her and giving her cash. Hmm. So now, based on an actual conversation, a bunch of these things that have been reported about have actually been deconstructed. So you're not hearing about the protests. I want the headline to be, New Yorkers are giving away free cash to people who they see at LaGuardia Airport. They're taking mm -hmm. the time to stop at LaGuardia and say, hey, I think you need this. Um, or what I do, and I talk about this, because whenever I feel like I cross a line, I'm always very public. Like when I'm in the subway and I see the indigenous Migrants, which is something we're not talking about, right? It is indigenous migration. So uh, everybody who's pro-indigenous, go to 42nd Street and see who is selling the, the candies. The candy, yeah. uh, they're all indigenous. <coughs> or is the United Nations indigenous uh, organization supporting, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll just give her 20 bucks. I'm like, I don't need the candy. Here's 20 bucks. Bienvenida. 
How I always add that. Welcome. Bienvenida. No te aguites. Don't give up. It's going to be hard, pero no te aguites. Quédate. Um, so that's also happening in our city at the same time. Jonathan, jump in. Goodness. I had, uh, it's, I, I walk by one of uh, the uh, areas uh, every, almost every day uh, where uh, many people are waiting to get federal uh, papers and apply for uh, visas. These so you're at 26 Federal Plaza. Uh, yeah, I think you're there. So, so just let me interrupt. 26 Federal Plaza, again, if you want to see this whole notion of like, they're coming in and they're quiet and they're secret and they don't want to be known. They don't want right now, they're starting to line up in front of 26 Federal Plaza to spend the entire night outside so that they can get into 26 Federal Plaza tomorrow morning at 8 when it opens. Huge snaking lines. And they are right there like, hi, I'm here. Hi, come take my information. Jonathan. And they're there with their families and they're cold because it's, it's cold. winter. And the line is entirely outside and I walk by this line a lot and I think about uh, these issues a lot. But what I was going to say, I want to go back just for a minute here to the fox and the rabbit. <laughs> uh, uh, so you know, we're in danger of stretching the analogy go, so yeah. far. But <laughs> what I was thinking about there is um, I was thinking about all the, the ideas that the foxes actually kind of circulate so that the rabbit, you know, perhaps is more confused. And maybe there's a hundred rabbits, but they actually like the foxes. You know, they, 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 the foxes are their friend. And the foxes mm -hmm. talk about things that resonate with them, like parents' rights. Um, and, you know, having been at the center of, for the past three years, you know, we are also living through a moment where that is verging on the closest to both to every kind of um, moment that any free speech advocate would look back historically and say was uh, a kind of very dark period in American history. There are more laws trying to control what people can say in universities and schools or give books in libraries being proposed or have already been passed today than ever in the 1950s. Uh, there are, the the combination with Dobbs is creating a situation which is not being well documented at all about how we teach and talk about abortion and women's rights in public institutions in a whole bunch of states, which feels akin to uh, uh, the um, Comstock era, you know, the way in which uh, there was an effort to criminalize um, sexual activity and that also in, in all of it, the effort to demonize and kind of push back to the margins and into the closet the entire LGBTQ community. I mean, day, on, day in, day out right now, there is a uh, radical view that, you know, a book about, I don't know, pe two penguins in Central Park who might be gay is pornographic, that that is pornographic. I'm not making that up. And so th in terms of like people living in multiple realities and in terms of the rhetoric that's being used right now, you know, it is this, it's a real challenge if those rabbits can't tell anymore. You know, right. who's telling what, what's tr truth? I mean, how many of us have any idea of the things that we absorb from TikTok or anywhere else in the news anymore? Everything is distrust, everything is uncertain. You know, a lot of us have very strong convictions, but I, I don't, I, I think we're somehow hardening. Uh, and a lot of the time, we're hardening around like the wrong issues and not being well informed. And you know, the biggest the biggest issue that I see in all of that is that even the concept of free speech itself has been so warped in some of these debates. I mean, you close your eyes, five, six years ago, we would be talking about a conversation about the snowflakes and the trigger warnings it w and how we have to provoke the students and not be afraid of, of bad ideas it was all conservatives. It was all politically conservative. And now that, the same ideas have sort of been been switched, and and if you go to school boards, what people are saying is, you know, we have to protect the kids from from mm -hmm. the books. You know, the kids are going to read something in a book and then you know never come back. And it's like this alternate reality where I feel like some some politicians ought to just kind of sit down with like themselves from six years ago or uh, Ooh, that sounds uh, things like that. But but universities <laughs> just seem caught in this crazy situation in the middle. All right, so we're gonna open this up now to student questions, and we have a microphone over there. Um, and remember, um, I think what we wanted to do is to try to get three student questions, boom, 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 one after another, um, and mm. then we can respond. So that means your questions will be succinct, we hope. Um, okay, boy, whoo, there we go, yes. 
Uh, just come and stand, stand behind, in the, stand in the line. Those, are, you, if you want to come to the microphone, just stand up and stand behind this gentleman. Go ahead. Good evening. And if My you could just identify yourself, please. Yep. Good evening. My name is Fareed. I'm from the School of International Public Affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is more to the statement of being coddled at school. We have a case where there are legitimate fears that people are being targeted, that our voices are not being heard, and the university does have a responsibility to make sure that we all feel safe. But then on the other hand, we are a university, right, where ideas should be challenged. How do you get there? Knowing that you still want students to feel safe to come to class, but you don't want other students to feel targeted and attacked because these are very personal issues that we're facing today. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Next question. And panel, just if there's something that you want to respond to in particular, we'll, we'll know in a second. Go ahead. Hi. So my question is, what practical tools can you give, would you give us, the students, to combat this misinformation, if it is the right way to say it, this um, rhetoric or vision of reality that, that might be incorrect that these foxes or other uh, people might want to impose upon us. What what tools do we have as a student to create or, or create or create and question our minds? And you didn't tell us your name or your. Oh, my name is Odniel and I'm from Mexico. Well, what part of Mexico? <laughs> from Gu Oaxaca, Puerto Escondido. Orale! Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. <Bro. laughs> and what school, no. what school are you in? Are from you in the college? Puerto I'm in SPS. Okay. No lo puedo creer. I'm just having a moment here. <laughs> we'll talk later. Um, yeah. Yes, um, a young lady, yes. Hi. I'm Madeline. I'm in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences in the French department. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, one thing I was wondering, as we're talking about the need for civic dialogue and the often binary conversations, I'm wondering what we do about the areas where people are feeling more apathetic or somewhere in the middle where they may not have a strong opinion one way or the other or they may feel fear to not have a strong opinion and how do we uh re like reject or i guess kind of reduce that apathy and bring more people into the conversation Thank great you. great questions um anybody want to jump in we have basically the question of balancing student safety between uh, difficult conversations, uh, some tools to combat the mis and disinformation. Coming from Mexico, Paisano, you should be teaching us, actually. Um, actually, I did. There was, um, at the height of the Trump uh, administration, I was like, uh, US journalists need to be talking with Mexican journalists so they can understand what not to do when covering an authoritarian government, mm -hmm. right? And one thing you don't do is repeat lies, mm -hmm. like what Donald Trump said about Mexicans, which is lies. Mm -hmm. um, and then. Finally, jeez, uh, I can't, oh, apathetic. Can I say about the first question? Yeah. Um, so I think there's something that has happened, and, and I, I can be a little bit critical of, I think this tendency is mostly on the left, mostly seen on the left. But the conflation of having your ideas challenged and feeling safe and unsafe, I think one of the reasons why we conflate those two things so easily is that we have taken to calling everything violence. That if someone disagrees with you, if someone criticizes an idea, uh, anything, this was violent. Um, and if it's violent, then you would react in the way that most people react uh, to violence, which is uh, to feel unsafe uh, or to feel justified in uh, being aggressive or you know, canceling that person out or any of these things. Um, but actually, that's not violence. You know, especially in the journalism school, we talk about this a lot because we get exposed to things that actually are violent. Um, and so there's a distinction between something that's violent and something that you just don't like. Uh, and we should be mindful of that. That said, I've never thought it was that complicated to hold both ideas in your head simultaneously. That, you know, in my classroom, I said, everything is on the table. We respect everyone's opinions. Uh, you also do not have permission to attack people personally uh, around uh, aspects of their religion, their gender, uh, their sexuality, uh, of any kind of ad hominem uh, kinds of behaviors that could reasonably make a person feel unsafe. Uh, and I think that we have to pair those things away from each other 
uh, in order to be able to engage, because I've been in conversations uh, where I had an argument that I thought was like waterproof, uh, and then it got shot full of holes, um, and I did feel unsafe <laughs> about it. I felt unsafe because I wasn't as smart as I thought I was, <laughs> um, and that was a, an unsafe feeling for me. Uh, but that wasn't the same thing as being in jeopardy. Yeah, if if uh, if speech can be violence, I always think it can be met with the violence of the state. You know, and mm -hmm. I think that this sort of um, flexibility, let's call it, with terminology, is what we see going on with you know critical race theory and you know gender ideology and a lot of like words that are being weaponized in state legislatures right now. I think all three of the questions, though, to me have everything to do with like what are we doing to create the culture on campuses that you know supports everybody learning together and that seems like wow it's so simple and don't we all kind of know that and yet actually most campuses and most people who work there don't have much of a plan for how to do that haven't thought about what it really takes uh, in much depth, most uh, professors can tell you their a lot of their training came as grad students when they just sort of started talking to rooms full of people, and then they did that for a while, and they did it more and more, and then they got tenure and just kind of keep doing it, and that's what they do. That's what they were. Tra that is the training, right? Um, and then most of the students, you know, if if they had the right moment in the right milieu, they had a good experience, maybe in a residence hall, and most of the people who work in universities you know, sometimes let's say had like positive experiences and like the idea of working at universities, but them too. And you find yourself in this moment where I say like universities are radical. It's a totally radical idea to like go live or go work or go eat and or go be in a room full of people that you might like not agree with anyone in a room. And like you're gonna like work together somehow. You're gonna sit on committees. You're going to sit in discussions. Actually, that is kind of like unlike anything else you'll ever encounter. Even if you work in, an, in an, any, any job you're gonna have one day, you're likely to have more in agreement with the people you work with in that field, a, a shared disciplinary background, maybe shared values, than you do in theory on a university campus. And yet, like nothing really exists. So I would say my answer to all three questions has everything to do with how we change the conversation about what we're here at a university to do. And it starts at the beginning, you know, like when you come into campus, when you start working on a campus, when you get hired as a professor, what is that year or two that you're going through that gives you the tools to talk about you know how we just reset the expectation that everybody has an opinion on everything because in social media days we all must know we can all make the video about what we think about everything right away and we actually just sort of have to learn to say to one another I, don't, I haven't thought fully about that or I haven't made up my mind yet or I have some ideas but I'd like to learn more and I think there's just an opportunity right now for the universities around the country and this is a very common conversation to sort of pause take a deep breath and kind of just reinvent what this looks like because I think the tools remarkably actually a lot of universities have the tools to do this they just you know don't talk to each other well we we have the tools and you have the tools it the tool is called critical thinking mm. and and you apply that critical thinking to understanding through reading through understanding context, because everything has a context, everything. Nothing exists in this world by itself. Everything has a context. So what is the context? Understand the history, what got us from where we were before to today. These are all things that require critical thinking, deliberation, careful consideration. And you know we have the, our core curriculum here at Columbia. Now, I have my criticisms of the core. I think it's still too Eurocentric. But one of the good things about the core is that students study debates that took place in different parts of the, the world, in different time periods. They don't just read an opinion. They read the debate over it. And so if you can think about how people debated, I'm going to say it again, slavery or whatever, you know, or women's rights. These were debates that didn't start today, right? So you need history, you need context, you need knowledge, and then you need the fortitude and the courage to come to your own conclusions, right? As our website says, we don't tell you what to think, we tell you how to think. Those are our tools. And as long as we are in an atmosphere where certain phrases or chants are considered out of bounds, we're never gonna get to that part of the critical thinking. Right? We have to step back away from that because some students say they feel hurt. You know, actually, 
I'm just going to say this too. I mean, a lot of students feel afraid and feel for their safety. Not just Jewish students, our Palestinian students, our Arab students feel very afraid because they don't feel they have the same rights to s express themselves. And so I don't think that's acknowledged. It's not, it's, there's, it's not, there's an asymmetry of, um, I think there's an, I'm just going to say, there's asymmetry of respect for free speech because there's certain bounds have already been drawn about what's acceptable. And so if I feel that you saying something that I don't agree with makes me afraid, I think we have to step away from that paradigm. We should say, well, what, what do those phrases mean? What's the history behind those phrases? They're, it's very complicated. You know, from the river to the sea, that was invented by the Likud party to take all of Palestine, Israel, and get rid of all the Palestinians. That's, that's the eliminationism of from the river to the sea. It's, a, it's an Israeli slogan. So, but let's get into that history. Let's talk about it. And, and so I think that we have the tools. It's what we do here. It's what we've been doing here for decades, for scores of years, for since Columbia started, is to teach you how to think, not what to think. And I think if we can, turn, we can return to that and cut through this atmosphere of, of tension and anxiety and fear, you know, let's get back to, like you said, the basics of learning. Which is why I will say, as a Barnard student, I took CC. Oh, you did. And it they changed let you my take life. It? And oh. it changed my life. It actually changed my life in, in ways that are very profound. Uh, we, the mic is still there, students. So, please, yeah, thank you so much. Did anybody else want to finish up or do you want to move on to the next group of questions? We're okay? All right, we're going to move on to our next group of questions. So my name is ask Ma your question. Yeah, say, my name is Michael Feiler. Okay. Uh, while sitting here, I think I've come up with a way to marry the means of, civil, of civic dialogue with an important end. So I would say the need for civic dialogue has never been greater in the states of Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Georgia, and Arizona. We, <laughs> we have a very important election coming up, and I think the need for civil dialogue in those five states, which are gonna determine the presidential election in nine and a half months, are very important. So I know I'm gonna be in those states trying to convince people, and I urge other people to do the same to try to prevent Donald Trump from so where being are you president going? again. Where will you be going? Pennsylvania, it's closest. Which is fascinating. Okay, Pennsylvania, whoop, literally 15, well, no, 30, well, 45, all right, an hour. It, it is a swing state. What is the swing within the swing? Anybody know? The swing population within the swing state? Latinos. So people are like, wait, P P Latinos in Pennsylvania? Yes, get oh ready. Yeah, it's actually yeah, the yeah. group that I am most focused on, and if you're watching, where what Kamala Harris has been doing, she's been hanging out a lot in Allentown and Reading, it, which is actually a center of the Puerto Rican, and there's a community and there's been a lot of organizing around that. So it is a state and it's right here. Okay, go ahead. Just the, the, I have to, uh, of course, add the, the old political saying about Pennsylvania, which is that uh, it's Philadelphia and Pittsburgh with Mississippi in between. <laughs> <laughs> and Mississippi, now, actually, in real life and there also is filled with Latinos and Latinas. So Mississippi is going through a massive transformation. So it's all changing. Sorry. By the way, some of those Latinos in Mississippi, because they're going to want to be like everybody else in their communities, if it's predominantly white, they will end up becoming Republican and voting for Donald Trump uh, because of uh, that, that dynamic of of wanting to be a part of what they consider the real America. Okay, go ahead. Just identify yourself again real quick and your question. Sure. Uh, my name is Ian Boring, the School of General Studies. Um, my question is with regard to the arbitration of, um, of civic dialogue, because I think that there's like a, an assumption of kind of an absence of power, but all dialogue is happening within a, a context of, of power. And there's this idea from like feminist theory and also kind of uh, uh, the anthropologist David Graeber wrote an excellent essay about it where in a chain of command in any kind of a, a, an imbalanced power relationship, there's kind of a tendency for a lopsided imagination to happen where the people in positions of power just are not compelled 
to, with sincerity, consider the, the point of view and the reality of the people over whom power is exercised. So Noam Chomsky has a, a kind of version of that, which he says, uh, speaking truth to power is greatly overrated. Um, is that power is already aware of the truth. Uh, how else could they so effectively obscure it? Damn, Chomsky. Um, but, but um, you know, that um, obviates the idea that speaking truth to the power to power is the only truth that you're speaking. Um, because what winds up really being powerful is speaking truth to your peers, the lateral relationships. Mm. Uh, and so when we think about, you know, one of the things, my good friend Adam Surer at The Atlantic points this out, you know, consistently, is that when we think about authoritarians, for instance, uh, or uh, and when political theorists and political scientists talk about totalitarianism, you know, one of the things that happened after the demise of the Soviet Union was that people began to think that the term totalitarian was useless because no one can exercise total power. That even authoritarians have politics. They have authoritarian politics, but there's still forces and countervailing forces that they have to be aware of. Uh, and so in the United States, if we're going back to the slavery example, you know, slavery was not supposed to end. Uh, and then, you know, what happened over the course of uh, the 19th century that pushed American politics to the impasse where there was a war that led to you know, abolition, uh, or uh, any of the other kind of social reforms that we've seen involved comparatively powerless people who through a process that began with dialogue among themselves forced people who in theory had infinitely more power than them to recognize their aims and ambitions. Uh, and so power is, is you know, crucial to that dialogue, but the power doesn't, doesn't only exist with the people who are at, putatively at the top of the hierarchy. Damn, that was, that was hot. Um, all right, so we have like four minutes left, and I see one, two, three, four, five students. Um, so students, would you mind just saying your question really quickly and maybe we can get some final comments from everybody because sure. we do want to um, hear from you. Thanks for the panel. Uh, my name is Saba Osmani. I'm a PhD student in the climate and health program here. So talking about kind of the war uh, against kind of facts or concerted anti-fact campaign is often seen analogous to anti-science. Um, so our profession is absolutely necessary, but it's in a sort of crisis. And so how can scientists or scientists in training really do to communicate in these times, especially when it comes to important issues like climate change. I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Um, great, great question. All right, next question, go ahead. Um, my question's kind of similar in nature, but in a different take in that um, when one tries to be an activist and tries to activate, like tries to advocate for a cause, there's a necessary presentation of ideas and facts that support a certain particular worldview that your activism is being driven by. And I wonder what options and methods can be taken to try and get a group of people who have ideologically opposed activist goals into a room to have dialogue um, because they will present facts, the same shared group of facts available to everyone in different ways so as to bolster their particular viewpoint. And that drives certain student groups from into protesting efforts for dialogue because it's a very complicated issue and so I wonder what your thoughts are. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Identify the, your name school. Um, Edison Hong, I'm in the School of the Arts, playwriting. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is about when we're talking about universities and their role in society in, in large, at large, uh, there is this vilification process that's going on of universities. And so what, mm -hmm. what can we do to combat this so that we can take the role that we should be having in society? Correct, thank you. Hello, my name is Paul, SPS. Thank you very much for the value conversation. Um, my question is, so I've had many conversations with classmates. Um, however, there are some of them are very focused and hooked on their opinion and unwilling to have a conversation. So my question is, is hate an opinion? And how am I able to have a conversation with my classmates? Thank you. Sorry for the philosophical question. No, we like philosophical, especially at the end. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Sophia. I'm an undergraduate senior in Columbia College. Um, 
I just wanted to ask about the idea of this panel being civic dialogue and as an undergraduate student, especially as a student journalist, um, I'm just wondering about like how we're supposed to believe in the tenets of civic dialogues when what's been happening on campus, we're not really allowed to take part in the conversations that lead to increased NYPD presence, the disbanding of student groups on campus, censoring of faculty websites, having to scan in with your ID on a closed campus, which I've never experienced in the four years that I've been here. Um, just curious about why that's really something you're trying to promote when our administration doesn't adhere to that. Thanks. And I think that's part of, um, thank you for your question. I think that's part of why many of us were like, what, how, how do we handle this? Because it is in fact an active conversation or lack thereof on the, con on the campus. Um, any quick final thoughts, because I've been told that we have to wrap. Um, I want to say something about civic engagement and talking to people that you don't agree, that don't agree with you. I think you have to try. Mm. You have to try to talk to them. But there's some people who do not want to engage with you. And if we take that on a larger scale, right now, I mean, climate is a great example. You can't argue with the climate deniers. You just have to educate everybody else, right? If I'm going to Pennsylvania, I'm going to talk to the people I know who can be mobilized against the authoritarian threat, right? Women, right? Women who are concerned about reproductive rights, people of color. I don't think, I don't want to argue with the Trumpers, right? I think that's not where our time should be. So I think there's civic dialogue and then there's the authoritarian threat. And we have to try to have dialogue, but we have to, I mean, we meet the threat with votes, by voting. We take back our democracy. The vote, our vote is the most, is not everything, but without it, we're screwed. So our vote is, right now, I think our vote is one of the most important things. We have to fight voter suppression, all the disinformation, and get our votes out, because that's how we squeak through the last time, and hopefully that's how we can beat beat it, the authoritarianism this time. And, Author and authoritarianism is not just the leader. The leaders have followers. Right. And so we have to beat them with everybody else. And, and this notion that it's like the election is decided or he's going to win, or that's part of voter suppression. Right. When you hear that and it's being talked about just like in the midterms where it was like it's a red wave, there was no red wave. So think of those as acts of voter suppression. We're gonna start with you, Courtney, and then just come on down, except for me, since she already spoke, to just give quite a quick final thoughts. Yeah, two, two quick points. I think to the point about speaking truth to power, I think we have to stop starting at the point of assuming people just don't have the information and be clear that it's not just an absence of understanding, right? And I think some of the comments spoke to that. So think strategically about how we're engaging these systems. The second point I think that we didn't get a chance to really grapple with but we've touched on is just the crisis of the university and society. What are we doing? Why are we having these conversations? What role and function do we think universities serve? And I think there's ways in which we're acting in defense and out of fear and not really rooting ourselves in the function of a university and the unique qualities of being in an academic institution and reimagining what these institutions should be and how they should be functioning in society. So thank you, points. Courtney. Bruce. Two very quick points. So a number of questions about where is a safe place to have these conversations. And safe place, my, pe my colleagues are not going to like this, are in your classrooms, your professors. And if they're not having those conversations, you should ask them. We'd like to have these conversations. And if you'd like to, to a little support or to, or to the professor some, some ideas, go to a uh, website, Braver Angels. They bring together people, uh, Red Blue is there a thing and how do you have these conversations There's all sorts of little tricks to do in a way so you don't end up in a hostile environment actually a, pro a productive environment that's what those classrooms are forced to have those conversations so I, I would encourage that even though not every professor wants to and just one last point it's not about the facts I completely agree most people know the facts and for example the fact is that minority uh, because of our electoral system, the mi minority in many cases has a lot of control in this country. But it's all about the perception. And the perception in this country is that the power is right here in this room. 
It's here in New York City. This is where the intellectual power of the country comes from. This is where the fiscal power comes from, the wealth. The business is controlled here. The thought comes from here. The media. How many TV shows are there set in New York City? How many are there set in Youngstown, Ohio? Right? The perception much of this country is this is where the power is. And that's bred a lot of resentment. And so while factually I completely agree with you, I don't think that's the way a lot of Americans feel. Jeez, they just don't like law and order? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Mm -hmm. I thought uh, the point about oh, I don't get to here. Go. Oh, do you want to go? But you already gave your final. You can say But more. if you want to take a final, oh, okay. go ahead. I was just going to thank the last student who spoke. Mm -hmm. I think what she said was really important, and I hope our leadership takes that really seriously. Thank That's you, Bay. Uh, I thought the point about speaking to peers is really important to understand that, you know, if you think about any moment of major cultural change in the United States, where it's abolitionism, suffragettes, gay marriage, like how how did that happen? If everybody knew what to think and the truth was so absolute, and the people in power were never able to to squelch it, and actually there have been very clear moments where power changes hands. I think the biggest mistake that any of us and or our institutions can make in these moments is thinking that the answer to this is to encroach upon the freedom to speak, the freedom to create, the freedom to imagine, um, and the idea that there are, you know, words or things that cannot be performed or can't be said is, you know, just a detriment to totally antithetical to the notion of the university itself. Absolutely. And it will be an undermining of those very efforts to speak to peers in provocative ways. The most illustrative concept that I have to offer when I think about these things is not only that we have to start our conversations with other people from a place of empathy, that kind of curiosity that I spoke about, you know, why do you think that, where, where did you learn that, why do you, why do you have that rigid belief, um, but also I talk about how professors can, and universities in general, really lean into, I think, a notion of open and respectful exchange. It's not one or the other, it's kind of both. That is how you, I think, have that space where someone can say, I don't know what I believe about this yet, or I'm you know, willing to hear you out on this issue, um, but you know, again, maybe you can't speak to hate, but can you ask someone to be respectful? Can you explain to them where they're crossing the line? Can you try to lean into openness once? Can you try to lean into it a second time? And maybe on the third time you can't. Sometimes the dialogue, you know, isn't possible. Sometimes the power differential is too real. Um, but there, I think that we can't lose sight of that. And you know, speaking to the last student on the policies at universities, I think I, I really do fear that that a lot of universities right now are kind of going too far and you know face real pressures to try and. I don't know, you know, the, the crisis mentality is real. It's very intense. But we are seeing, you know, once we start to give in on the idea of not protecting free speech to its fullest, mm -hmm. you risk empowering all kinds of, of prohibitions. Um, and the rationalization for a lot of things that we are seeing being prohibited right now is that, well, the universities can't run themselves, so the government better step in and do so. And so um, that's a really dangerous place that we're in. Slippery slope. Dean Cobb, take us out. Um, so I want to thank everyone for uh, coming out tonight, and I want to thank everyone for uh, for participating in dialogue. You know the very thing that we're talking about, uh, and you know I'll just kind of dedicate my last comment to the student who asked uh, the question uh, about uh, you know the values of the university. Uh, you know whenever I, I say you know, I get any question about what happens at a university, I, I will always tell students that the institution exists primarily for you um, and that you know if you believe that we have fallen short uh, in expressing the values that should be central then I believe that you should articulate that in the same way that you did um, you know, because fundamentally as a school of journalism we have to believe uh, in freedom of expression in order to be able to do our work uh, and you know we have to believe in academic freedom in order to be able to do our work here. Uh, and one minor point that I'll, I'll add to that is that being privy, I think I'm not speaking out of turn, being privy to some of the dynamics afoot here, uh, you know, having to swipe in, you know, to get onto the campus, uh, or kind of being concerned about the gates being closed. Uh, I understand 
how that looks and I understand how that appears. I will also say that we have been navigating circumstances in which there are very real dangers. Um, and we don't know, like something happens and, and there's no, uh, you know, n no injuries, no harm or anything like that. Uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, there wouldn't have been if we had adopted another uh, practice. The unfortunate reality is that very often one of the impediments we didn't talk about here is that, you know, even as pitched and heated as, as conflict and debate can be on the campus, the most volatile elements uh, are usually not associated with the campus. Mm. Uh, there are people who come from uh, other places with the intention. Uh, I think even if we have a kind of common regard for Columbia, uh, there are people who don't, uh, and they intend not to further any kind of dialogue, but they intend to kind of sow chaos. Uh, and so trying to navigate the space in which you preserve your um, values and you also uh, navigate those kind of complexities is important. And the last thing that I'll say is as you exit, um, please take note of the images that are posted on the wall in the lobby, um, which our students in the journalism school uh, created the memorial for the now more than 80 journalists um, you know, who have died in, in Gaza, seven of whom died in Israel, um, but 96 or so percent of uh, you know, the journalists who've died have died in Gaza, uh, attempting to cover that story, uh, attempting to tell the world, um, you know, what they see, what they hear, uh, you know, what is happening around them, and if we ever have any question about the import of protecting and defending freedom of speech and academic freedom, then we should look at those faces as we're on the way out and recognize that these are people who literally gave their lives uh, in order to protect that that principle. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm so glad that you, um, I'm so glad that you brought that up, Dean Cobb, because it's just, it is for us as journalists and where we are in the uh, School of Journalism. So I'm going to tell you a quick journalistic story um, and I'm going to send you off. So sit down. <laughs> bueno, te fuiste. Okay, goodbye. Adios. The rest of you sit down. So it goes to the dialogue and the curiosity question, right? So um, whenever I'm in a car, especially in an election year, I'm talking politics with whoever's driving the car. So it was, I guess, maybe a year into the Trump uh, presidency, maybe two, no me acuerdo, I was in a car in Chicago on my way to the airport very early in the morning. I didn't really want to start talking politics, but it's my job. Um, and I knew that Trump was going to win, by the way, because of this. So everybody was like, she's crazy. And I was like, nope, he's going to win. So it wasn't a surprise to me. But anyway, so I'm talking to this guy, and I'm like, so, you know, Trump, Trump, what do you think? And he's like, oh, my God, he's such a nice guy about Donald Trump. Such a nice guy. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, that's totally crazy, but I didn't say so. I just said, so tell me more. Tell me more about why you're feeling this, why you're thinking. Oh, so the whole conversation on the way to the airport was me being a journalist and just listening and listening. When we got to the airport, I said, you know, I just want you to know, because he was also very religious. I said, um, so you, you talked about Jesus Christ and blessing me, but I want you to know that because of Donald Trump, if Jesus Christ, if Mary and Joseph were at the border, she pregnant with Jesus Christ, Donald Trump would say, you're staying on that cement mm. there. You're not coming in, and, and, and you're Mexican too, so you cannot be let in. And, and so I said to him, the driver, I was like, and so you need to know, like, I'm a Mexican immigrant journalist woman, and so um, the, th the, th the way I feel about this president is that I am exactly all of the things that he hates, and I'm also flat-chested. There was a joke, there was a joke there, you can laugh. Um, always trying to lighten the mood. Um, and, and I explained to him how this was really hard for me because I'm like, I, as a Mexican journalist, what he is representing is actually a real challenge to me. We he walked out of the car, he was lifting up the thing, and, um, and he said, you know what, oh, I learned so much from you just now. Can I give you a hug? 
to which I said, of course. And so there we are, hugging at the airport. Now, I'm not sure I'm hugging my gym trainer, <laughs> right? We go at it, though, but she's prepared to dialogue. You know, she, she is. But the point is, and this is what I st stress to my students, please don't give up. You may not be able to do it every day. You may not be able to bring the energy of every moment, every day. We need to, to take care of ourselves, walk in nature, you know, et cetera. I meditate all the time. It, but we do. This is the essence of democracy. And I'm a democracy junkie because I had to raise my, white hand, my right hand in order to become an American citizen. And I had to say that I would bear arms. I don't like guns. I would say I had to, I had to th say and swear I would bear arms to defend this country. So I take democracy really seriously. And while the vote is not going to solve it all, it is at least the one thing we do know. And also, to bring it back full circle, when I was a little girl and we didn't have, uh, we only had green cards, we couldn't vote, but my mom took me to street protest for black rights, for civil rights. And so I understood that democracy is the vote, but it's also democracy on the street. It is that, and it is both are active parts of our society. And both, I hope we never give up. And I really want to thank everybody in the audience for coming out and being so, so in tune with what's happening here. It's not easy, but honestly, you guys, I hate to say you guys, honestly, you all did really, really wonderfully. And to my panel, just thank you so much for shedding such brilliance on a really complicated topic. <laughs> Good night, everybody. It's cold out there, so stay warm. So on behalf of University Life and the School of Journalism, I'd like to give a special thank you to each of our wonderful panelists and our amazing moderator. They deserve it. <laughs> uh, I want to thank everyone for who's joined us today, especially in person. But those of you online, we know you're there. So thank you very much um, to learn and share in this conversation. We'll have vi video of tonight's event on YouTube. Uh, channel and you'd like to revisit this conversation or share it with a friend, please just go to universitylife.com. Uh, lastly, I'd like to share two more important opportunities with University Life that allow you to be a leader in dialogue like the one that took place tonight. Campus Conversations is the first. This is a chance to engage with peers in a small group discussion workshops. We also have facilitated programs that allow graduate and professional students to lead conversations with their peers and there's a stipend for participation as well. Uh, secondly, we also have Dialogue Across Difference, the mini-grant program. You can apply for funding to support the production of an original project that encourage you to engage in the diverse perspectives and navigating challenging conversations. You can find all of this information for both of those programs on universitylife.columbia.edu. If I said .com, I, forgive me. Once again, thank you, everyone. Please get home safely. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>